Hello and welcome to the 538 Politics Podcast. I'm Galen Drake. The House passed the approximately $2 trillion Build Back Better bill on Friday. Any version that passes the Senate is very likely to be amended, and it's still unclear when that might happen, although Majority Leader Chuck Schumer has said the goal is by Christmas. As we've discussed on this podcast before, many of the individual provisions in the bill are popular. But what does that mean for how the public views this package as a whole? We're going to take a look at that today. We're also going to check in on where the redistricting process stands around the country. About a third of states have already passed new congressional and legislative maps that will be used over the coming decade. And many other states have maps in the works. So is one party making significant gains through gerrymandering? And what happens if competitive seats go extinct? And finally, it is Thanksgiving week, so we're going to reflect on what the two parties have to be thankful for. And a note on that, because of the holiday, we'll only have one podcast episode in your feeds this week. So here with me for this Thanksgiving edition of the 538 Politics Podcast is Editor-in-Chief Nate Silver. Hey, Nate. Hey, everybody. Also here with us is politics and tech reporter Kaylee Rogers. Hey, Kaylee. Hey. And senior elections analyst Nathaniel Rakich. Hey, Nathaniel. Hey, Galen. So uh, how's everyone feeling about Thanksgiving? Although I know, Kaylee, when, when do Canadians celebrate Thanksgiving? In October, which is much more sensible because it's not like butted up right next to the December holidays. You have some time in between. Oh, just starting off the podcast throwing bombs at a American holiday. <laughs> yeah, don't you want like a compressed period where you can like basically not do work for like a month or something that seems better no i don't understand how americans get anything done they're so like they're just so compressed into this one very narrow stretch and also for the the record that's the whole point of holidays is that you're not getting (laughs) stuff done for the record (laughs) canadian thanksgiving predates american thanksgiving so really it's a it's a canadian you can just kind of kind of bluff your way through all of november and december wait explain this for six weeks because our Thanksgiving started in 1621, so I feel like you—that's you, you're gonna—it's gonna, it's gonna well, be I hard gotta, for you to. Now I gotta that. look up the the date, but um, this is actually the 400th anniversary of the first Thanksgiving, which of course happened right here in the great state of Massachusetts before it was a state, of course. The Canadian celebration predates the American one by more than 40 years. Wait, what? So is this just based on like the date that Congress made it a holiday? No, uh, in 1578, uh, an English explorer by the name of Martin Frobisher had the first Thanksgiving dinner with his crewmates. They were headed to Newfoundland. So that Wait, we count that headed, as Canadian first Headed to Newfoundland. So it so well, you know, they were still on the in boat. Canada yet. Okay. I, don't I mean, know. that was the first one. Um, wait, what website are you are you checking this on? Fact checking this on? We got to cite our sources here. This is five thirty eight. Sorry, this was from uh, History of Yesterday, but I've read this before. I'm sure I could find a CBC link for you, or or we've got one here for McLean's. <laughs> I didn't know I was, you know, I was reading about the Building Back Better bill and things like that, rather than when when who has the older Thanksgiving holiday. <laughs> Stupidly, in preparing for this podcast. Um, well, that's a shame because we're only talking about Thanksgiving today. Um, (laughs) in any case, that's a good reminder. Let's talk about the Build Back Better plan. The plan passed the House mostly along party lines with all but one Democrat, Jared Golden of Maine, voting for it and all Republicans voting against it. Some of the biggest items in the bill include $400 billion for universal preschool and childcare programs. $555 $555 billion for climate change programs, expanded health care coverage for elderly and low-income Americans, expanded work permits for ind- immigrants who have lived in the country illegally for a decade or more, and $166 billion in housing aid aimed at preserving or building 1 million affordable homes. The plan also raises the cap on the amount of state and local taxes people can deduct from their federal taxes. The package is paid for largely through an additional tax on people making more than $10 million a year, a 15% minimum tax on profitable corporations making $1 billion or more a year, and a tax increase from 10% to 15% on corporations' foreign earnings. The bill also provides more funding for IRS enforcement. So there is a lot in there. Obviously, none of this becomes law unless it passes the Senate. So at this point, do we expect this legislation to pass the Senate? And if so, what is likely to change in the process? Kaylee, kick us off. Yeah, I fully expect that it's going to pass the Senate in some form or another, but obviously there's still some tinkering that's going to 
come through uh, mansion and cinema have made it pretty clear that they're not going to throw their support behind it unless they get to you know have their way uh, manipulating a little bit i think it was interesting that mansion in particular called out the parental leave the four weeks of parental leave uh that's included in this because it's a very popular mandate and it's something that most other developed countries in the world actually all of them i'm pretty sure have in place and much more than four weeks but that seemed to be one of the sticking points for mansion which i thought was interesting cinema has been calling more attention to some of the issues with the tax so you know i think that there will still some some tweaks coming once it hits senate but i have every expectation that it's going to get through does everyone agree i don't think it's obvious um, Ooh. I mean, you're right that probably something will pass because it is the kind of thing that you can bargain on, right? It doesn't have to be all or nothing. Having passed the infrastructure bill, that kind of reduces the strategic complexity a little bit. Um, but it's not crazy to me that, I mean, you're dealing with mansion and cinema and they are strong-willed and independent-minded um, <laughs> is the way, you know, I think their critics might put it differently than that, right? Um you know, you're dealing in an environment where there is uncertainty about the economy and, and high inflation. Um, this bill does have a pretty high price tag. So, I mean, I think I think Kaylee's right. That's where the smart money is. It'll probably pass in some form, but I don't think it's, like, quite guaranteed. I don't know. I mean, maybe there is this weird thing where, like, you know, sometimes parties kind of realize they're in trouble electorally, which Democrats certainly, you know, not looking great for Democrats in 2022 – Sometimes they're kind of like, well, let's just kind of go over the barrel together, right? And let's go ahead and do what we're going to do because we're probably, we're probably f***ed either way, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know? So I think ironically things like um, like Virginia might make this clearer for Democrats potentially. Wait, but there's also an alternative to that, which is that it seems clear that the party is not doing well electorally and then kind of freezes up and doesn't want to do anything that's going to piss off voters even more. I mean, which is more common if we look back at American history? Well, let's look at recent history, right, that mm-hmm. the parties generally have. I mean, Republicans got cold feet on um, rescinding Obamacare in 20 – what year are we talking about? It was like 2017. 2017? Right. Yeah. Um, but they did pass a big tax bill that wasn't particularly popular at the time. You know, in 2010, Democrats did pass Obamacare even though after they lost that seat, that race in Massachusetts to Scott Brown. So the recent – the past two times this came up. Parties may not find consensus in their ranks for everything they want to do, but um, but they actually do kind of say, hey, let's take our advantage of a majority while we have it. Yeah, I mean, if I were Democrats, I would say that, I mean, to this point, they've done not that much. I guess they just passed infrastructure, but like that was after the Virginia elections, for example, and it hasn't kind of turned out well for them electorally. So if I were them, I would think, well, let's just go big or go home, throw Hail Mary, whatever metaphor you want to use, um, and and try to you know do something to kind of change the status quo, which obviously isn't looking good for them. That said, I do want to point out that there's not a lot of evidence either way um, that, you know, if they pass a, a huge, uh, you know, game-changing Build Back Better plan, that things will um, get better for them politically, um, nor if that like doing nothing and kind of tacking more toward the center will be better for them. I think it has a lot more to do with these broader trends, like the fact that it's a midterm year for a democratic president. And then also kind of things like what happens with the pandemic or the economy, um, and kind of what the, the national mood and optimism is come November. I'm curious what you guys think the political benefit is for mansion and cinema to completely basically like kibosh this bill versus, you know, playing, strong arming it and, and trying to get some changes and they, they can point to it and say, well, I didn't just let it pass. You know, I held strong for these things that I believed in. I don't tend to assume that politicians are smart or rational. Um, <laughs> I think they're two very different cases, though. I mean, there was polling that came out today that showed some uh, um, it's nonpartisan polling, it's not some progressive group, showed her behind in a number of potential Democratic primary matchups. I don't think what she's done is kind of consistent with what you'd expect someone to do who's trying to maximize their chances of being reelected in both the primary and the general election. Um, Matchin is such an outlier that I kind of think to like um, guess from the outside, first of all, whether he even wants to run for reelection, I guess 2024 or not, right? I would find it um, hard for some outside observer to claim they know what is in Joe Manchin's best interest in a state that he has managed to get reelected despite it being extremely Republican, the kind of modern West Virginia. So I think grouping them together is is complicated. But um, 
but you know he is not bluffing i don't think and again whether he wants to run for uh senate again or run for governor or whatever else right um i mean to even have him kind of halfway on board in a trump plus 39 state is a huge bonus for democrats and i think they don't recognize how much of an outlier he is right kaylee i think specifically the situation that you're talking about a situation in which Manchin and Cinema say, nope, we're not voting for this at all. There's not a different version of this that we want. We're just not voting for it uh, is pretty unlikely. But what you might see happen, which is essentially what happened with Republicans attempt to repeal the Affordable Care Act, is Democrats in the Senate put together this plan. They know some of the things in the plan aren't going to be appealing to Manchin and Cinema, but they put them in anyway and they kind of force a vote and they call their bluff and they say, this is the plan that we've got before us. You know, if you're going to vote against the Democrats, you're going to vote against the Democrats, but here it is. A situation like that, you could see them saying, no, I actually, I'm not going to vote for this and, and the bill failing in the Senate that way. Although subsequently you would expect that then it might get tweaked and they wouldn't throw it out altogether. I mean, Manchin could, I mean, he is more of a classic bargainer type, right? And so maybe he does think there's some ways where he looks like he can serve up a more palatable version of it for West Virginia voters. Although again, kind of the correlation between like what he wants and kind of what actually polls better is tenuous, I guess. Um, but yeah. Yeah. I kind of see a scenario where Manchin is just put in the driver's seat and people are basically just like, all right, Joe, what do you want in here? And it, to Kaylee's point, it, you know, if you're a senator given that kind of power, you're going to want to pass something. Um, and maybe it'll just be a list of things that Joe Manchin wants and, and not some of the more ambitious liberal proposals. But um, it does seem to me like the most likely outcome is something will pass. It won't be as as ambitious or probably as costly as uh, the bill that passed the House. Um, but it'll be, you know, share kind of, it'll be a skinny version of that, basically, to borrow another term that we used during the Obamacare debate. I want to turn a little bit to the polling on this Build Back Better plan. So in previous podcasts, we have talked about individual provisions that are quite popular. But this plan faces a contradiction that isn't uncommon in American politics. Sizable majorities approve adding Medicare benefits, universal pre-K, incentivizing home solar panel installation, and all kinds of other things. And this is in, in various different polls, but most recently I've looked at Politico morning consult polling. But taken as a whole, Americans aren't really sure about this package. So in a recent Ipsos poll, 25% of Americans said the package would help people like them, and 32% of Americans said it would hurt people like them. So that's more than the people who said it would help them. Looking at the whole economy, Americans were split with 34% saying it would help or hurt. So about even there. And then, of course, those don't add up to 100. The remaining aren't sure or say it wouldn't help or hurt. So given that people like the individual provisions, but don't really seem that hot on the package taken as a whole, how does how do views of this kind of legislation play out in the short, medium and long term? Do people change their mind if it ends up getting passed? Um, does it become less popular? Does it become more popular? I think a lot of it's going to depend on two things, messaging that voters are getting from the respective parties and how they're going to spin on either side, but also which of these provisions are going to impact them individually um, at a first person le level that's going to um, change how people react to it. I'm thinking in particular the child care changes and how some experts have predicted that the, it could potentially cause like a run on, on daycare spots and, and maybe even increase costs of daycare for people who are, are middle and upper middle income. And if people are experiencing that, even if, you know, Democrats are saying, just wait, you, you know, your turn's going to be coming, you're going to be uh, eligible for these benefits too. When you're paying more every month for daycare and you add in inflation and we just came out of a pandemic and everything else, I think that that's going to affect people more directly and, and change their mind more than any kind of messaging might. Yeah, I don't find the fact that individual elements pull well to be very relevant or compelling. Ooh. Um, because drag me, public, drag me. <laughs> <laughs> that's not how the public will interpret the bill, right? Yeah. It'll be a bunch of big new spending packages. They may not know much of the details. And I don't think Democrats have necessarily done a good job of... <laughs> Selling the details, I mean, the, the very name Build Back Better makes it sound like infrastructure, which was largely in the Such other bill. Such a terrible name. Terrible branding. Yeah. Um, and maybe that's smart because you can, like, lump together a bunch of policies, some of which are more popular than others. I'll put it like this. I don't think it's going to be, like, grossly unpopular. I mean, I think there'll be some individual 
provisions that people notice and appreciate. There'll be some, like Kaylee says, that may be implemented in awkward ways that they don't like as much, right? Um, but they may also say, why are we spending all this money in the midst of, we just spent a lot of money and with high inflation, and you'll see that talking point reflected by you know different media outlets. So it's not like the public or the media really spends that much time talking about policy these days anyway. So um, I don't think it's going to be like a major factor like either way necessarily in like the midterms. I mean, as far as promoting what's in it, Democrats probably couldn't because they didn't know what was going to be. There has been so much back and forth over this bill and what was ultimately going to get passed. So um, touting too much that might not have made it in would probably be also a bad idea. Yeah. I mean, Kaylee, you mentioned that the way this gets messaged is going to shape how the public views it. I mean, looking at this whole package, what would you expect Democrats to focus on to the specific policies that Democrats might focus on in the coming year? And what do you think are the specific policies that Republicans might focus on? I think the Democrats are going to focus a lot on the child care spending and the changes to Medicare, just because that affects so many people and they are popular um, changes that have been, you know, pushed for for a lot of people for a long time. I mean, like child care affects all kinds of families. It's not just lower income families. Um, and it's a real kind of economic puzzle of how to solve that problem. This is the Democrats attempt at that. So we'll see how that plays out. But I think that that's going to be something that they're really going to tout a lot. Whereas the Republicans, I feel like all they have to do is point at the price tag. And that's their argument right there. No, I mean, they will point to the price tag, you know, 2.2 trillion or 1.5 trillion. They're all pretty big numbers. But again, it's kind of like if we have um, lots of inflation and a stagnant job market, uh, nine months from now, those attacks will resonate. And if we don't, they might not as much apart from like more hardcore partisans. And so therefore it's kind of like, you know, it's just kind of a way to argue about the economy more than the, the text of the bill itself. Yeah. I think for Republicans, the Republican argument will be much more about vibes to use a, you know, kit term that the kids use. Um, and the Democrats argument will be about the specific, uh, individual elements. And, and that does just go back to the, the, the element of the, the branding of the bill and how kind of Democrats kind of by nature of the parliamentary process had to kind of lump all these things together and put it into one package to, to pass it. But that is a challenge on the messaging side of things because you can't spend, you know, 15 minutes listing all the things that the bill does. You have to summarize it into something pithy like build back better, which then becomes amorphous, which then is able to be kind of twisted into, you know, Oh, it's, you know, Republicans will call it, you know, Biden care or something like that. Actually, Obamacare is a good example where um, a lot of the individual components of Obamacare were popular, um, but because it was summarized with this kind of derisive sounding um, name that was tied to a, you know, polarizing to unpopular president. Um, it was able to, you know, the, the public opinion did break down again along kind of the vibes um, aspect of it. Although I will say that Obamacare, of course, did eventually become more popular as it kind of aged and, and it, it failed to be repealed. And as Obama faded as a political figure, um, you know, thermostatic public opinion and all that jazz. Um, and so in theory, the same thing could happen um, to the Build Back Better plan. I know a lot of the components, um, such as including the child care, right, Kaylee, um, expire after a few years, and they're kind of banking on it being renewed because at that point, people will be used to it, and uh, they want to, um, you know, people at that point presumably will want to keep the status quo. All right. Well, of course, we will keep following both public opinion and what actually happens in the Senate. Let's move on and talk about redistricting. Here at 538, we're tracking the congressional redistricting process as it happens in every single state. So far, about a third of states have passed new maps, and many other states have proposals in the works. According to our tracker, both Republicans and Democrats have each gained four seats that favor them, and four highly competitive seats have been eliminated. So we want to take the opportunity to check in on that process. And Nathaniel Rakich has been leading the charge for the website. We have this big tracker, which if you have not yet checked it out, please go to 538.com. It's over on the right hand column. And there's tons of information in there that we will not be able to summarize entirely in this segment. So go check out the website. But Nathaniel, that's the top line number. You know, Republicans are gaining four seats. Democrats are gaining four seats that favor them and four highly competitive seats disappearing. But what kinds of trends 
uh, underlie that that we're seeing in this redistricting process. I think one really important trend is what you kind of mentioned, which is that the number of competitive seats looks like it's on track to reach um, an all-time low. Um, but I do think that our kind of the issue is that there are a million different ways to kind of slice and dice the numbers and to say, you know, how to count a, a gain and how to count a loss. And so you've seen actually, you know, for instance, the New York Times had a story recently where they um, made the claim based on doing the math a, a different way that Republicans had, had gained more seats than Democrats, um, whereas us and also the Associated Press have had kind of a more um, – like, you know, uh, it's been net even between the parties. And I will say that one way in which I think our method does kind of hide one of the trends beneath the surface is in terms of looking at the number of kind of like light red and light blue seats. So one thing that has happened is that Republicans have made a lot of their incumbents in light red seats safer. And so I'm thinking specifically of Texas in this regard. So like the, the kind of top line number in Texas didn't change all that much in terms of, um, you know, the next congressional delegation is likely to look at pretty similar to the the current one. But um, what they did was they took a lot of Democrats who currently sit in competitive seats and kind of gave them safe blue seats, um, which was a concession, I think, to the fact that Texas's demographics are changing. The suburbs there have become more democratic. Um, but then at the same time, there are currently a huge number of Republican incumbents who sit in these kind of marginal seats, like maybe R plus five or something like that. And they took basically all of those seats off the table as well, moving those um, to be safe Republican as well. Um, and there are a lot more of those seats in Texas uh, and around the country than there were the kind of the marginal blue seats. Um, and so you, when you look kind of under the hood, um, you can see those numbers. So I actually broke down that plus four for Republican seats into the, the light blue, or sorry, the light red column and the dark red column. And um, by our definitions of that, um, there have been a net gain of 11 dark red seats and a net loss of seven uh, light red seats. So, of course, that adds up to plus four for Republicans, but it really shows how that is moving. Um, you know, th those the map is becoming less right. competitive. And especially over exactly. the coming decade, if you thought that those districts were going to become more competitive, that's not so. What about for Democrats? I mean, are we seeing Democrats shore up their, where Democrats are gerrymandering themselves? Are we seeing them shore up their incumbents or try to kind of broaden out the map and add more seats? Um, both. So we haven't had a lot of um, kind of Democratic stronghold seats finalize their maps yet. So one state where Democrats do control the redistricting process where they were able to add themselves, um, they, they both added themselves a seat and they made you know, again, kind of their own competitive, vulnerable seats, safer for Democrats. Uh, one of those seats is, is states is Oregon. Um, and, uh, but then one state, for example, Illinois, um, which is going to be maybe Democrats' biggest weapon in redistricting that, or New York. Um, Illinois hasn't finalized its map yet, so it's not included in our numbers, but that's a, a great example of a state where Democrats are going on offense. They're drawing um, a couple of Republican representatives out of their districts um, and, uh, and and trying to shore up a few of their Democratic incumbents, although actually, you know, in that case, they put they pitted two Democratic incumbents against each other. So it actually does, um, now that I think about it, look more like they are aiming to benef benefit their party in general uh, rather than individual incumbents. And actually, you see this also in Nevada. I thought this was really interesting not to get too nerdy about it, but um, Nevada Democrats We've crossed themselves that line. a map. <laughs> yeah, sorry. <laughs> Um, but Nevada Democrats drew themselves a map where they unpacked a solidly blue district around uh, Las Vegas and kind of took those Democratic voters and shared them more equitably with the two swing Democratic seats around there. And so now kind of the three Democrats in Nevada's congressional delegation are going to sink and swim together. Basically, they're all in kind of slightly Democratic leaning seats. Um, so that was interesting where they basically threw uh, Dinah Titus, this one incumbent in a safe blue seat under the bus in order to um, to maximize their chances of having three seats in Nevada. But now there's a chance that they will have no seats in Nevada, especially if there's like a red wave election in 2022. One of the things that I noticed, and I'm just curious if you've noticed this as well, or if I'm making a mountain out of a molehill, is just how in some of the states where there's independent redistricting committees or, or bipartisan committees, how much trouble they've been having getting maps passed, um, especially because the data was late this year. So I'm thinking specifically of Michigan, which has... They have a new independent redistricting committee that has proposed, I think, 25 maps 
already. Um, so having a little trouble finding consensus there. And then even Washington, which has had an independent commission for, you know, since 1990, um, missed the deadline. And now it's going to the state Supreme Court there to try to finalize the map. So is that a trend that you've also noticed? Yeah, I think it's a mini trend right now. I don't think, I think I'll reserve judgment until the end of the process to see whether that is an overall trend. But I think like a state like Michigan, that's having its first experience with an independent commission. So I do think they just are kind of working out the kinks um, themselves. And they're also citizens serving on the commission. Um, so they might, might just not have the institutional memory um, to uh, to maybe have that process be smooth. But I do think that, um, I think Michigan is an example where I think it'll kind of turn out all right in the end. Um, but yeah, Washington is a great example. Virginia also. Um, and those, those states are interesting because to make a slight distinction here, um, Washington and Virginia and a few other states have bipartisan commissions as opposed to independent commissions. And so I think that's where you're seeing um, the, the stalemates is when you, any system that is basically forcing Democrats and Republicans to agree on something is not uh, working out too well. Um, you're seeing something similar in Connecticut, uh, where they have kind of a bipartisan backup commission, um, which is currently deliberating that is not expected to produce a map, um, which will throw things to the state Supreme court there, which is already what's happening in, um, in Washington and Virginia. And then not the same situation, but in Wisconsin, you have a Republican legislature and a democratic governor. They hate each other. Wisconsin polar politics has been very polarized for, for a long time now. Um, and, uh, unsurprisingly, they were unable to agree on a map. And now that process is also going to the courts. Um, and so that's, you know, that's not a commission and I don't think anybody expected them to, to agree. Um, but definitely, yeah, the trend is that, um, you know, it's, it's fine being coming harder and harder for Democrats and Republicans to find common ground on redistricting. So in Michigan, they apparently name plants after trees in Michigan. <laughs> is that right? It is. Yes. Apple, birch, chestnut. I guess D is going to be dogwood. What do you think? E is elm. Is there an F tree? Sorry, I'm distracted. Fir. Fig. Fir tree. <laughs> fig. Uh, we don't have fig trees in Michigan, I don't think. Mm. Oh, fir. Yeah. Is that a requirement? Fir, for sense. sure. Fir feels more Michigan. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. No, I appreciate their creativity. As, as someone who spends a lot of time staring at maps that are number, you know, given serial numbers or just, you know, the 12th plan, the 13th plan, the 14th plan, I really appreciate what Michigan is doing. Uh, yeah, but as we were mentioning, certainly not every redistricting commission is created equally. And this is for folks who have listened to this podcast for a while, something we explored in the gerrymandering project back in 2018. We looked at the commission in Arizona, as well as the commission in California. I mean, Arizona was like, I mean, chaos. Somebody had to go to the FBI because of threats that they were receiving involved in that commission. And then California seemed a little more functional um in terms of how they went about it but you know a lot of power is at play in these decisions and so things become discordant or can become discordant pretty quickly i do want to mention so we talked about kind of how the current map maps that states are drawing compare with the maps that we already have but of course the maps that we already have aren't entirely you know pure those have been those were gerrymandered a decade ago as well so i'm curious nate What's the what's the starting position of these maps? How biased are the set of maps that we used over the past decade? They were drawn after the 2010 cycles, which were very good for um, for Republicans. I mean, part of why some of their the arguments about like, oh, how bad are these maps for Democrats depend on do you compare them to the maps from 10 years ago, uh, or as compared to like some abstract way in which there's in which there's no partisan advantage, right? Um, Clearly, the maps drawn 10 years ago were very favorable to Republicans. Um, this year, they're probably going to come out, be roughly as favorable overall. Um, but you can emphasize that aspect that hasn't changed that much, although there are debates about how much since 2010, or the fact that, like, you know, in a neutral year, you're going to have probably Republicans win the House, um, which is kind of a sign of, of obviously districting and gerrymandering. Nathaniel, we try to calculate kind of based off of some kind of you know, interpretation of what is fair, not just where the maps were over the past decade. And we, we use a couple different benchmarks because this stuff isn't, it's not exactly easy to figure out what is politically fair. Um, but using the benchmarks that we do, what can we discern? Yeah, no, I think that's a, you know, Nate's point is very well taken. You have several states um, that have 
been, that were drawn by Republicans, for instance, after 2010, and they're being drawn again by Republicans this year, and you don't necessarily have a huge shift in uh, the number of seats, but um, but that's because they were already kind of pretty gerrymandered um, by Republicans. So, you, for example, you look at um, the Ohio map, which is the most recent map that changed. And so efficiency gap, which is this measure of wasted votes and kind of the number of Democratic votes that don't go toward a candidate winning and the number of Republican votes that don't go toward a candidate winning and kind of looking at the imbalance between those things. So on Ohio's map, um, the old map had an efficiency gap of 20 points in favor of Republicans, which is a lot. Um, and then the new map has an efficiency gap of 16 points in favor of Republicans, which is like slightly better, but still a lot. Um, and so you see the same kind of pattern in like North Carolina um, and, uh, you know, and, and doubtlessly other states um, before the end of the cycle uh, is over as well. And then I did just want to put, um, you know, to go back to Nate's point, put some numbers on it. So um, the uh, after the 20. 11 redistricting cycle um, that year in the 2012 elections, the House had a bias of 5.5 points toward Republicans. Um, so basically that means that the the median seat or like the tipping point seat um, to use the, the 538 terminology was five and a half points more Republican than the nation as a whole. Um, by the 2020 election, because of trends like um, suburbs becoming more Democrats, that uh, advantage for Republicans had dissipated to uh, only, quote unquote, uh, 2.1 points. Um, so it's still there, um, but it's not as severe as it was kind of immediately after the um, the very Republican dominated redistricting cycle of 2011. Um, and then, yeah, to, to echo Nate's point, my guess is that we will end up with a similar bias as we currently have. So maybe like a two or three point bias toward Republicans um, when this cycle is said and done. So kind of locking in an already Republican Republican leaning status quo. So one of the top line takeaways here is the disappearance of competitive districts. What does that mean for our politics? I think in a lot of people's minds, a competitive district or a competitive election is why we have democracy and kind of it does a lot of things, which is like force people to come up with actual ideas or arguments to run on. And maybe, you know, keep people away from the fringes of their party because they have to appeal to a median voter. Is that actually the case? Do we overly romanticize competitive districts? Do they do they do they kind of keep people more in the keep politicians more in the mainstream? No, I mean, look, there's a lot of reasons for higher polarization and partisanship in the U.S. And I think a lot of negative consequences to it. But like the fact that the vast majority of members of the House don't have to worry about winning over swing voters and instead only having to appeal to um, to their party base, um, of course, that has consequences for sure. Yeah, I think it definitely makes, you know, primaries more and more important, um, you know, like – in many ways, the November elections now are less relevant than what happens between March and September in terms of, you know, these fights between the progressive wing of the Democratic Party and, you know, a more Biden or, or moderate uh, wing. And then certainly on the Republican side, um, you know, the fight between kind of the Trump true believers and, and maybe the old guard Republican Party in some very large proportion of seats, you know, those are the races um, that are going to matter and not the general elections. I wonder if having fewer and fewer of those really competitive districts will just, you know, increase the pressure as well as obviously the funding and the attention on those competitive races uh, rather than sort of spreading it out and having it more around the country. Yeah, I mean, in theory, if you have 217 Democratic seats and 217 Republican seats and there's one really competitive seat in, you know, in Kansas <laughs> City or something, race. then hell of a race, yeah. <laughs> and it, it maybe also... Um, you know, again, it depends on where the final numbers end up, but maybe it does, you know, create a situation where we have a house that looks like this house, you know, it's either going to be a narrow democratic majority or a narrow Republican majority, um, you know, for the foreseeable future. And that can give a lot of power to some of these small blocks in the house. Um, it can make, you know, passing legislation a little bit more fraught. Yeah, for sure. Although, although, you know, but overall, if you have fewer people in swing districts, you have more party alignment, right? Um, so you see blocks actually, you know, the primary opposition to democratic policymaking in the House is actually from the left, I guess, right? Like kind of squad and squad adjacent folks. So there's also like a contingent of suburban people who are concerned about um, like the salt exemption and stuff on Big Back, Build Back Better. But you'd have like, I mean, this all kind of is, it's all in the same regime, right? Um, 
you have a house that behaves in a more parliamentary way because um, most people are only beholden to their party when you have districts that are they're so non-competitive. Yeah, and I I, I should you know, um, you know have made this point as well because uh, I wrote a piece earlier this year about how the House Caucus, uh, the Democratic Caucus, currently um, in this nearly divided Congress, is. Um, one of the most cohesive um, caucuses recently, and, and there are all sorts of uh, theoretical reasons for that, which is, you know, historically that the in when they have to stick together, um, you know, parties do tend to do that. So these are some of the consequences of having fewer competitive seats and more party alignment. Of course, something that we looked at when we did research the gerrymandering project and reported it out is that, you know, gerrymandering plays a role in the elimination of competitive districts, but it's not the whole answer, right? There's been a lot of geographic sorting. Um, for example, if Republicans and Democrats live next to each other, think literally like one Democrat, one Republican, one Democrat, one Republican, it's really hard to actually gerrymander. People have to live separately from each other in such a way that you can actually draw a circle around, you know, one party's voters or another. Um, and so kind of we've divided ourselves uh, to the point where we've become very easy to gerrymander and it's become increasingly easy to, to draw these uncompetitive uh, seats in a way uh, because you know how people are going to, you essentially know how people are going to vote in federal elections in a way that you used to not know because there were more swing voters and people people lived all together. Um, so uh, we will cont continue to track the consequences as these maps get drawn once they're finalized we'll talk about this again and we'll, we'll see how it bears out in in congressional representation in the coming decade uh but let's have a little fun now um and talk about thanksgiving it is thanksgiving week and i hope all of our listeners are having a great holiday in the spirit of thanksgiving we're going to take a minute before we go to reflect on things to be thankful for this is called having an attitude having an attitude of gratitude and since this is a politics podcast i'm curious to hear what you all think the two parties have to be thankful for. And who wants to go first? I mean, should I go first? Because it's easiest so that way I can't have my ideas stolen. I mean, <laughs> that's why I want to go first. Not a very gracious Thanksgiving attitude, but go ahead. Go ahead, Nate. Go first. I'm going to go out on a limb here. I think Democrats should be thankful that they have a Democratic president and a Democratic Congress. That's bold, Nate. Hot take. Bold. No, it is so wow. weird. Like you get, you get like, there's just like kind of, I don't know if you call it like a meme, right? Um, Cynical hipsterism. But it's kind is of that common for like a certain type of, a certain type of like progressive Democrat to be like, oh, everything is so terrible. And this is the worst of all possible worlds. And, and, you know, every pessimistic projection about everything has been right. Um, which if you're a Democrat, is not true because you actually won the presidency last year and you, and you albeit barely won the Senate and barely kept control of the house. Um, that's a big deal. Or it should be if you're a Democrat at least. Right. Um, and so, yeah. And it's kind of, I mean, it's a weird world where like the bar is kind of set in a very weird place. Like Democrats already have already passed like a lot of very big, packages of spending, right? And now they're kind of mad that they may get a smear, may, may or may not get like a very big package that's a little bit smaller than what they might have wanted, but still is a lot of money and a lot of democratic priorities. And so, and so if you kind of look at like objectively, quote unquote, kind of what, what's actually happening in Congress, then the Democrats should be probably more thankful than they are. Right. I think a lot of Democrats don't even remember that, uh, the how well, that Congress passed and Biden signed a $2 trillion bill at the very beginning of the year uh, in the American Rescue Plan. Yeah, there's a lot of money being spent by um, Democrats by this the Congress and kind of how spend, things yeah. are. Yeah, and how things are framed or not is kind of is kind of is kind of weird. I mean, I think there's like I think the question is like the fact that uh, pessimism is fashionable among like Democratic media consumers, right? Like how many articles have there been about like Will there be a new doomsday COVID variant, right? And I'm sure those like click like super well and whatever. Um, I do wonder if the fact that like pessimism is fashionable among Democratic elites kind of makes it a little bit harder for the party to um, to sell its agenda as compared to Republicans who, you know, even when things were really terrible in the middle of the uh, 
lockdowns the, and the, we're still in the pandemic, right? But like last year, right, where people are kind of shutting their homes and the economy tanks by more than ever has in a single like economic quarter and whatever else, right? You know, Trump is still kind of everything <laughs> is selling, awesome. hey, things are on the up and up and, and COVID will go away soon and whatever else, right? And Democrats, I guess, are like, you could say they're more honest, but I think they also just like, they have like a, a, a they think it looks savvy if you're pessimistic, which often it is. Also, like, this is a pretty cynical podcast, so maybe we should also look at the Yeah, there. but cynical, no, cynicism is out. It's sincere pessimism. That's the um, problem. Okay. All right, does anyone want to disagree with Nate's take that <laughs> Democrats should be thankful for having control of the White House and Congress? No. If there are no not, takers. I'm not going to disagree I mean, with that. <laughs> no, I mean, he's clearly right, kind of on the, like, objective side, but I also understand the, the frustrations of people, with Democrats, particularly when you compare it to the expectations in the 2020 election and, and the Senate in particular, where, you know, a 50-50 majority is, is extremely difficult to work with. And when you do factor in, um, you know, kind of the systematic, um, like pro Republican bias in, in our institutions, it does seem like this is likely their last trifecta in a while. Um, uh, you know, at least the, the, you know as far as we can see in the future. And so, um, yeah, I, I, I understand their disappointment of not being able to do more with it. Uh, but I agree that they should be relieved that the situation isn't worse for them, considering uh, everything else that's kind of stacked against them. Okay, Nate, Republicans, what should they be thankful for? I mean, they should be thankful that. Uh... <laughs> this is a hard country to govern and that there are a lot of implications from the pandemic that are still kind of feeling their way out um, in society. Um, I think they should be thankful that Democrats classically are fairly shitty at like message discipline and love to fight with one another, um, which always makes um, whatever policy you're trying to pass look worse. Most important thing of all is like, they should be thankful that like currently as constructed, the GOP coalition punches very much above its weight as far as the actual number of voters in the electorate. That might not be quite as relevant in, um, in 2022, where most likely the GOP will win a majority of the popular vote for um, the House. So it gets pretty close in polling right now. Um, but, you know, the fact that Democrats only have 50 senators um, when they easily could have, if you somehow had things proportional um, to population, they would have the equivalent of like, 56 or 57 senators, right? And then you probably do see all types of things. You maybe see the Supreme Court expanded. You see, um, you know, major uh, bills on redistricting passed and other things like that, right? And so they should be thankful that, like, at their high watermark, Democrats can um, can only do so much and have to rely on people like Joe Manchin and Kirsten Cinema. Anyone disagree? I feel like that was, like, four things. Yeah, there was a lot of things. Yeah. It's a I know. That's why I went a first. A cornucopia. That's why I went first. I just took up all the things. Well, that's not fair, Nate. You're supposed to share. Okay, does yeah. anyone want to disagree with any of the four things? <laughs> no, those are on. Were we, were we supposed to disagree on these? I you feel can't, like we're you all cannot, I mean, well I just want to, I want to give you the opportunity to have your take Someone dissected. Give, Nathaniel, give a bad take, and then I'll disagree with it. Uh, what, were the, what were all the things Taylor I already Swift forgot? Taylor Swift is bad. Okay, well, that's a terrible take. Exactly. Objectively. Yeah. Um... <laughs> I don't know. I disagree. Your first one was Republicans should be thankful that America is a hard country to govern. I don't think that they should be thankful for that. I think that's a disappointment and that both parties probably want to be able to govern well the way that they see fit. All the other things stand, but it would be nice if America were easy to govern. Not right now. I mean, I'm just assuming we're talking about electoral politics. But if you want to be honest about it, like I think, um, I think parties pretty openly do root for failure if it makes them more likely to be mm -hmm. real or makes them more likely to win elections. Right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think your other takes are just better. Maybe like enduring because once Republicans are back in office, they're going to want it to be an easy country to govern. I know your other, the structural things that you described later on are enduring. They should always be happy for those things. Anyway, Nathaniel. What are your, what do you think that Democrats and Republicans should be thankful for? Yeah, so mine kind of go hand in hand, so I'll, I'll do them together. Um, and I, this is just kind of how I think about American politics in general um, these days, which is that I think that Democrats should be thankful for the fact that they 
there are, by most measures, more of them than Republicans. Um, their policies in general are popular. Um, and, you know, as we talked about with, you know, kind of build back better, a lot of these, you know, things that are considered liberal policies, you know, pretty significant expansions of government, things like, you know, I don't know, also, you know, marijuana legalization and, um, you know, uh, gay marriage and, uh, Obamacare now and things like that. Um, these are all, these all pull very well. Um, and kind of, I think that Democrats have the, the numbers behind them and that's what they should be thankful for. But at the same time, I think that Republicans should be thankful for, uh, the structural factors that Nate said, um, which is that the fact that the electoral college, the Senate with its rural bias and the house with gerrymandering are all skewed toward Republicans and all kind of give outsized weight toward Republican areas of the country, um, which is able to counteract. I think the fact that there are slightly more Democrats than Republicans in the country, um, overall and, uh, and make elections competitive and, and perhaps uh, in the future make Republicans uh, favored to win, um, you know, more elections, certainly in, in places like the Senate, um, you know, more seats than they might be entitled to, um, you know, despite the fact that the Democrats might outvote them. Doesn't our most recent polling show that there are now more Republicans than Democrats? The generic ballot, you mean? I don't even think the generic ballot. I think we have seen in some of the most recent polling that now more Americans identify as Republican than identify as Democrats. Doesn't this shift a lot, like once one party or the other gains control? Yeah, right. You know, similar to the way that the generic ballot shifts. Uh, I didn't see that poll, um, but I think I, I meant in general kind of more long term, you know, like Democrats have won the popular vote in seven of the last eight presidential elections, right? Um, and with, you know, kind of their their policies being more, if, if everybody just voted on policy, I think Democrats would would win, um, you know, even more handily than they do. Um, so so kind of that's what I meant kind of in, in the grander scheme of things. Um, Democrats have the, um, you know, the, the substance and the numbers and Republicans have the, the structures. And that is, to me, the big um, kind of push and pull in American politics um, in this particular era. Policy, who is she? We don't know her. <laughs> Does anyone want to agree or disagree with Nathaniel? I have a very pedantic objection to something he said. Please What's do. That? Um, the Senate doesn't have a rural bias per se. It has a bias towards low population states um, that currently manifests itself as rural areas having more power. <laughs> Well, I that's true, that right? but you can imagine <laughs> because no, that's definitely true. Like Delaware is urban, but it still has as many senators as, you know, whatever, California. Right. It has a, it has a state bias, which manifests itself as a rural bias. Yeah. Have you looked at how many Dakotas there are, Galen? There's two Dakotas. <laughs> We've never There's talked about this two. on this podcast before. <laughs> Weird. I thought there if were. If there were North Delaware and South Delaware, although maybe South Delaware would probably be, would one of those be a swing district? I don't know, maybe. Um, it would. But like, but yeah, but there, but there are countries where cities are their own states, right? Um, or provinces, whatever, parishes, whatever the hell they call them, right? Um, and in that case, it's possible to imagine the Senate having urban bias, right? If the top 30 U.S. metro areas were all their own state and 28 of them were reliably Democratic and there's Miami or something, right? Then you'd have a big built-in uh, Democratic bias in the Senate. Urban totally bias. true. Also totally irrelevant because the facts <laughs> on the ground are well, rural no, bias. <laughs> I mean, not totally irrelevant for Democrats thinking about their long-term prospects as a viable party in America, given that the Senate is never going to be abolished, right? Like, Look you think at, it's more practical to redraw the boundaries of the states? No, than no, no, to no, no. No. The Senate? no, I'm saying, I'm saying, <laughs> say. I'm saying this. Like, how does the Democratic Party become viable in Idaho? I don't know. Like, Idaho is not completely rural. It has these cities that are growing uh, pretty quickly and suburbs that are growing pretty quickly. So, how do you appeal? Maybe you are not going to appeal to rural Idahoans, but there is maybe a coalition that you could piece together in Idaho that includes, you know, suburbanites and urban Idahoans in a different way. Right. So I think that, I think that maybe that's like worth paying attention to, but you can disagree with me if you want to. I mean, a state like Idaho or to maybe take a more obvious example, like Wyoming, like Democrats can win a hundred percent of the urban and suburban vote there and they will not come close to winning Wyoming. So, um, although an extreme, and I want to, I want to follow up with what I said. 
Republicans and Democrats now have equal numbers of Americans who identify as both. Okay. Um, okay, moving on. Kaylee, what should Democrats and Republicans be thankful for? I was going for something a little more specific to this exact moment in time when I was thinking about this question. So I thought that Democrats should be thankful that they have been able to pass the legislation that they have this year. You know, we mentioned earlier um, some of the achievements that they've made. And You'd think like, well, that's a given when they control Congress and the White House. But as we've seen, it's not been a given. So the fact that they've been able to make the progress that they have, I think they should be really thankful for. Um, and we'll see you know, how far that extends as we get through the end of the year. Whereas Republicans, I feel like, can be thankful for the current state of public opinion in this country, which is not great for the Democrats. The president's not popular. People are really unhappy with the economy, with the president's agenda with what's being passed like there's just a lot of kind of discontent which is in general a bad thing for a country but great if you're heading into the midterms i think the other party is in power and people aren't happy i'd be pretty thankful about that okay fight me who <laughs> yeah yep i agree i, I i'd be interested me i don't know how we would do this but like i am kind of interested in this question of like Given the size of their majorities, what is like the like average or like replacement level amount of legislation we would expect Democrats to pass? Like, I, I do, I, th I, th I think your point is is well taken, Kaylee. I think that the the COVID relief bill and the infrastructure bill are, are pretty impressive accomplishments for given the narrowness of majorities. Um, but like, is that is should we should we be expect should that be expected? Is that more than than should be expected is it less than should be expected i can't imagine it's less but yeah i think it's more i mean it depends on whether bbb passes right but even without that um i mean there are very thin majorities i just looked up what percent Kayla, of idaho an is for rural and it's 30 percent. sorry i'm not paying attention um uh 30 <laughs> no where did is you this see this the right number Nationalpopularvote.com. Yeah, um, Do you have it, Nate? Because we have, because we have the the you've. Well, we have our own. We have our yeah. whole own conception, man, of what makes something so, rural or urban, dude. This is complicated. Um, which but no, like it it messes up the argument even more, right? Like Maine and Vermont have some of the highest uh, rural population percentages, which also means that, like, I don't know, maybe Democrats just have to go do some persuasion. New England is very weird. No, if, if you run if you run the numbers, I mean, first of all, like, yeah, they're all different types of like. I mean, Vermont is rural. I Maine is pretty rural, right? But like, you know, if you run the numbers all the way through, there's a significant advantage for for rural voters. It's huge, right? And you can cite some exceptions, but we've actually done the work, Galen, and found that despite those exceptions, like Vermont that the Senate greatly benefits the GOP. Well, but I was, I was, so I was more interested in if Idaho is truly only 30% of the population of Idaho is rural, then I would think that if Democrats wanted to, they could have some opportunity to go in and persuade suburban and urban voters okay, in Idaho. So, so first of all, any distinction that treats rural versus urban as a binary is stupid right. and we can do better than that, sure. right? Um, Which is why I said suburban. And so we kind of see it more as a spectrum based on kind of how many people are are around you, the average voter in a state. Um, you know, I mean, in Idaho, you don't have like a lot of big cities. We've been, this podcast has been to Boise. We have been to Boise. Um, it seemed very liberal. Yeah. Uh, it was, right? I think. Yeah. Uh, lots of micro brews and, uh, but like, it's not as liberal as like uh, Manhattan <laughs> or something, right? Um and there might be places that, because like these Western states that historically were not very populated, I mean, people still kind of tend to live in like urban settlements, right? Um, because there are almost no people in like the absolute sticks, right? It isn't necessarily hospitable if it's like mountainous terrain in the same way that like New England might, where it's somewhat mountainous but livable, right? But like the fact that states have like a lot of wilderness doesn't mean the population is rural because in some states yeah. nobody lives in the wilderness. 100%. This is right? exactly my point. At the same time, you know, Idaho actually is, I think, pretty rural by our more sophisticated metric. Um, there are a lot of smaller towns that may qualify as urban by the Census Bureau's definition, but the Census Bureau's definition is like not actually that 
high a bar for what what makes something urban. I think we should have a whole other podcast on this. Um, so thank you, sure. thank you for bringing up this as a as a topic that the party should be thankful for. So do you want to do you want to know what I think the party should be thankful for? Yes. Elections. Both parties should be thankful for elections. Well, as long you know, for a couple more years anyway, while elections last. <laughs> right? I mean, you lose. Nervous <laughs> laugh. You're on the ass. I mean, I mean, I guess this is also an argument for elections, period. But like in a democracy, you lose one day, you still get to make your argument, you get to convince the American public, you know, in an, in an ideal world, competition between the two parties makes everyone better. And uh, as a result, um, good ideas rise to the top and you can persuade the voters uh, hopefully with those good ideas and win elections in the future. There's, an, there's no need to uh, try to, you know, question the legitimacy of or do away with elections because there will be discontent and you will win in the future with your ideas. There's always another election. Nowhere is that more true election. than in the United States of America. <laughs> Something There's that we should all be thankful here. for. So this Thanksgiving, I'm giving thanks for elections. Thank you, Gabe. <laughs> <laughs> Too sappy? Should A I be more sappy. cynical? Nate? I'm just trying to figure out like the right type of cynicism. I don't know. That feels what like life is increasingly. It's just picking which flavor of cynicism will, will make it, help you make it through the day. What are the flavors? <laughs> Limoncello. There's like resigned <laughs> cynicism. There's what? Kaylee said limoncello. <laughs> said limoncello. Which is a reference to... It's called a limoncello. callback. <laughs> I thought you said YOLO, which is kind of like my favorite version of cynicism right now, right? It's like, well, <laughs> it's a mess, so how can we have fun? <laughs> um, all right. I, uh, on that note... Um, I hope everyone has a great Thanksgiving. You too, Galen. Happy Thanksgiving, Thank you, guys. All right, let's leave it there. Thank you, Nate, Kaylee, and Nathaniel. My name is Galen Druk. Claire Bidigary Curtis is in the control room and is also on audio editing. Our intern is Emma Riley. And you can get in touch by emailing us at podcast at 538.com. You can also, of course, tweet at us with any questions or comments. If you're a fan of the show, leave us a rating or a review in the Apple Podcast Store or tell someone about us. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you soon.